Okay, Rofan, please start. Uh, hi, hello. Today I will present some linear algebra basics. This tutorial is for people who have some basic understanding of linear algebra, but need to refresh their memories, or they have learned some concepts such as eigenvectors, but rank, but don't know why and the interpretations behind them. Also, it's for people who know how to do singular value decomposition, but don't know when to apply this technique. First, let me introduce some notation convention. We will use lowercase boldface character to denote vector and uppercase boldface character to denote matrix. And a vector is by default column vector. If we want to represent a row vector, we will use small a transpose instead of a. Given a matrix, it can be expressed in its row vector form or column vector form. This is this is an example of row vector form representation. And this is A in its column vector form. Some basic, uh? <clears throat> Hello, <clears throat> Robin, I assume that you prepare some questions here, right? Here, uh, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> I prepare some up, questions. Some follow-up questions, maybe keep going. Yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> So here are some basic matrix operation. For matrix summation and subtraction, we do it element-wise. But matrix multiplication is special. It is very different from scalar multiplication. Given two matrices A and B, first we need to check whether their shapes are conformable. That is, the number of columns for A is equal to the number of rows for B. Only if they are the same, we can multiply A and B together. The ij entry of the resulting matrix AB is equal to AIK times BKJ, summing over all K. Usually, AB is not equal to BA, and BA may not even exist. Only if A and B are square matrix, then BA exists. In linear algebra, there is nothing called matrix division, but we have some similar concept called matrix inverse. The inverse of matrix is only defined for square matrix. A square matrix A is invertible if there exists an n by n matrix B, such that AB is equal to BA is equal to identity. Then B is the inverse of A. Another important concept is called matrix transpose. They transpose matrix A transpose, just flip the matrix A over its diagonal. So the rows in A become the columns in A transpose. The columns in A become the rows in A transpose. Here are some important properties of transpose. These three properties are very useful when you want, when you want to derive some proofs later. Um, next, we introduce another important concept called rank of a matrix. To understand what is rank, first we need to understand what is linear dependency versus linear independency. If we have a set of vectors A1 up to An, and they're said to be linearly dependent, if a set of scalars where the scalars are not all zero can be found such that C1A1 plus C2A2 plus up to CNAN is equal to zero. If no such scalars can be found, then A1 up to An are said to be linearly independent. This equation means that if, if at least one vector can be expressed by a linear combination of the rest of the vectors, then the vectors are dependent. For example, if we move C2A2 up to CNAN to the right of the equation, then we can express A1 as a linear combination of A2 up to An then we know that A1 is somehow redundant and all the vectors are dependent. For example, we look at a simple matrix A and its row vectors are one minus one, minus two zero, and minus one minus one. The row vectors are not independent because the last row is equal to the summation of first two rows. Here, I prepare a question. 
So I want to ask some of you whether the columns of C are independent. Um, Zhen Feng, can you answer this question? Hello? Hello, I think Zheng Feng is gone. Zheng Feng, oh. Zheng Feng, Zheng Feng is uh, has some has some time. So Wang Chong has has uh, have the answers. So Wang oh. Chong, can you unmute me and unmute yourself and uh, make some explanation? Uh, I think it's independent because uh, we can find an A and B such that uh, the the two values. Ah, uh, let me. Oh, sorry. Um, I think uh, uh, it's dependent. If I set the column uh, one, the mid parameter for uh, for A to be one and the B to be minus two, then the third column will equal to the sum of A times first column plus two times second column. Yes, yes, exactly. So the last column is equal to first column minus two times the second column. So the column vectors of C are dependent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for answering. And the rank of a matrix is defined as the number of linearly independent rows or the number of linearly independent columns. So the number of independent rows and the number of independent columns are the same. So we can compute the rank either from its rows or from its columns. Um, so in the last slide, the rank of A is two because we can only find two independent rows. Uh, let's see what does rank means in geometry. If we let matrix A to be, its in, to be, to be in its column vector form, then the space spanned by column vectors of A is defined as C1, A1 plus C2, A2 plus up to CM, AM, where the C are all possible numbers in real number space. For example, my matrix B is like this, and it has two independent columns, one, uh, one minus one and minus two, zero. So any vector that can be expressed by C1 times one minus one plus C2 times minus two zero is inside the column space of B. And the rank of B is just the dimension of column space. Rank B is equal to two. That means the column space of B can only construct a two dimensional plane. So we can verify that any vector inside this two-dimensional space can be decomposed into linear combination of minus two zero and one minus one. A matrix A is full rank if it is a square matrix and all the column vectors are linearly independent. For example, the B here is not full rank because the number of independent column vectors is two less than three. So it cannot fully span the three dimensional space. A full rank square matrix A has another name called non-singular matrix. And a non-full rank square matrix A is called singular matrix. Um, in spectrum- I proposal questions, maybe you can ask someone else. So does a singular matrix has to be square? Yes. Has to be square. Yeah. Mm. So if it is not square, it cannot be considered singular. Yes. Mm. But why is it called a singular value decomposition? But this is something different, right? Yeah. Okay. Hmm. In spectral decomposition or in singular value decomposition, there is one important concept. It's called orthonormal matrix. A square matrix A is said to be orthonormal if AA transpose equal to A transpose A equal to identity. In other words, 
the transpose of A is the inverse of A. If we expand A in its column vector form, we will find that A transpose A is just this bigger matrix. If this big matrix is equal to identity, that means all its elements are the same as identity. And all the diagonal values are one and off diagonal values are zero. So in other words, the column vectors of A are orthogonal with each other. So A is linearly, so they are linearly independent and A is a full rank matrix. The length of every column vector is one. Do you have a question here? I think here is not so a little bit not straightforward, especially for someone who haven't touched linear algebra for, for long. For example, so we yeah, see so that A is also normal. Yeah, do you have any questions here for us to digest and uh, have a discussion here? Um, do you prepare a question here? No. Okay, so maybe you can think about the questions here. A and A transpose. Mm. So if A is also normal, that means all their column vectors are orthogonal. And the length of every column vector is one. So that is what what is implied by. Oh, maybe ask someone to provide uh, to provide examples for to provide examples for a for an orthogonal or also normal matrix. Oh, okay. Okay, maybe you can point someone because I find that there were guest Yang Hong is here. Yang Hong. Oh, Yang Hong is gone. <laughs> Yang Hong is. Yang uh, Hong. Okay, maybe we can ask uh, Xiang Lin. Xiang Lin. Ah, oh, you mean I need to propose a question on? No, propose uh, pro provide an example here. Maybe you can you can write here. Example. Uh, maybe you can write a two dimensional example for this. Uh, 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 let me think. Mm. Mm. A. I just randomly choose um an example. Um, mm. All elements are the same. Uh, for example, and uh, A prime. Uh, that a, be okay? Uh, a prime means A transpose. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, a transpose. So, uh, actually, actually, here is very close that you you say that a transpose is equal to an identity matrix. So actually, identity matrix is an example of also normal matrix, because the transpose of identity is equal to the inverse of identity. Hmm. So. So, so if let's say A is equal to an identity matrix, then identity matrix times the transpose of identity is still equal to identity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so identity is an example. That's a trivial example. Yeah. And a non-trivial example here? Um, it, it's hard to have an example because it, it has to satisfy that A transpose is the inverse of A. So. It's hard to think think of a good example here. Uh, if you know the rotation matrix in computer graphics, all the rotation matrix are um, trans are also normal. Yeah, are also normal. Okay, Wang Chong, can you raise the example here? So let's do a uh what the two D trans uh let me comment. 
let's do a 2D transform uh, rotation matrix. It should be cosine, sine, sine, minus cosine. And uh, both of them can be uh, alpha. Then this value means uh, rotation the matrix in the alpha direction in, in, the, in the space, yeah, should be. And uh, you can see the orthogonal is the same. So by, by, by multiplying this one, it's become, um, yeah, basically the first column is uh, cosine plus, uh, yeah, cosine, cosine plus sine, sine, so it's one. And then one, zero, zero, one, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure should be like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's a very standard orthogonal matrix. And for the third, yeah. So I think should illustrate the sample. Mm. Mm. Okay, well done. <clears throat> okay, please go on. Mm. So we have seen that this orthogonal matrix has really nice properties because all the, uh, the rank of it is full rank and all the column vectors are orthogonal orthogonal and of unit length. Does this remind you of PCA dimensional reduction? Because in PCA, we are trying to find some principal component directions. If we have M principal components, then that fully span the M dimensional space. And all the principal components are mutually orthogonal and they are of length one. In fact, given our matrix A, and suppose A is our data matrix, then PCA is just trying to find an orthogonal matrix B from A. Then we take the first K column vectors of B as principal component. So how does PCA do this is by spectral decomposition. Um, to introduce spectral decomposition, we need to first introduce what is eigenvalue and eigenvector. Oh, and so this is the rotation matrix one chart has mentioned. Um, if, if we have a matrix A and it is multiplied by vector X, so from X to AX, we can view A is trying to transform the X. So A is just a transformation. For example, A is a rotation matrix that can rotate X by angle theta. Then let's try a new matrix B. Um, if we apply this transformation B, on all vectors of unit length. So if we collect all vectors of length equal to one, then they will form a unit ball. There are infinitely many of them. Uh, after multiplying all the x with b, they will be rescaled and rotated to be a different vector. So here, uh, let's say we have x1 and x2. Then bx1 becomes t1 and bx2 becomes t2. Okay. Eigenvector is defined as all vectors that do not change direction after transformed by A. Because usually when a vector is transformed by B, its length and also its direction will be changed. But suppose we can find u1 and u2, that their direction do not change, only their length has changed after multiplying by b, then these two are called eigenvectors. Hmm. Um, we have said that u1 and u2 are somehow special because their directions are not affected by b. In fact, we can imagine b as trying to stretch a vector along two axes. One is u1, the other one is u2. If u1 and u2 are just on these two axes, then definitely they won't be rotated. So we now understand eigenvectors adjust the stretching axis for a matrix. They summarize how a transformation is performed. Mathematically, we define eigenvectors only for square matrix. If there exists a non-zero vector gamma i satisfying a gamma i is equal to lambda i gamma i, then gamma i is called the eigenvector of a, and the corresponding eigenvalue is lambda. Usually we will normalize the eigenvector to have unit length. 
So the eigenvalue here is just how much change in length for the eigenvector after transformed by A. Mm, usually the larger the eigenvalue, the more important this dimension is or this direction is, right? Yes, mm. yes. Because the transformation tends to stretch harder along that axis. So U1 seems to be more important than U2. Mm. Actually, every n by n matrix have n eigenvalues. We can find n eigenvalues, but they do not have to be all distinct. Uh, or some of them may be zero. Some of them may be complex number. Mm. So here, there is an interesting fact that if one of its eigenvalue is zero, that implies that A is singular. Because when the eigenvalue lambda is zero, then uh, so 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 for this equation we can move lambda i gamma i transpose to the left hand side. So that becomes like this, solving this solving this equation. When lambda is equal to zero, then the equation is reduced to solving ax is equal to zero. If it has solution for x, then A must be singular. That means the column are not linearly independent. Okay, now we know that a square matrix can be represented by a set of eigenvectors. When A is symmetric, it has really nice properties because all the eigenvalues, sorry, only the eigenvalues are real. And they are orthogonal. The eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. When A is symmetric, we have a spectral decomposition theorem says that A is equal to gamma times lambda times gamma I transpose, where lambda is a diagonal matrix and its diagonal values are the eigenvalues. Gamma is a matrix where its column vectors are the eigenvectors. Note that gamma is also normal because I have mentioned that when A is symmetric, the eigenvectors are also normal. So <clears throat> we can do a simple proof here why this spectral decomposition theorem holds. Since gamma is also normal, so by definition, we know gamma tr transpose gamma is equal to identity. If this equality holds, then we can multiply gamma transpose on both sides. We can have gamma transpose A is equal to lambda times gamma transpose. Because when we times gamma transpose here, uh, This two is equal to identity. So this disappear. Then we can expand both sides. We get, we get this. And finally, we can simplify the equation as this. And each element here is just the definition of eigenvectors. So we have proved that spectral decomposition theorem. What's going on? And uh, it's better that we you can provide it. But I understand that our time is a little bit limit. So we do not have too many questions. So mm -hmm. the goal of this talk is going to recap the understanding of linear algebra. So Yi Hao, you somehow get a point of the um, talk you, you gave it la last week. Yeah. So you do remember that um, when we are talking about the graph embeddings or the value flow embeddings. You remember that? Yeah, yeah. So giving this idea, I think Ruofan has already presented the general idea. So now I, I'm going to have questions. Maybe not every people, not every student um, can, will, can follow my question now, but I think you should understand. So when they have built a, a adjacency or enhanced adjacency matrix from the graph flows, and they apply singular value decomposition. 
Um, and I'm going to ask what is the meaning, so why they will apply these singular values compositions to generate a new graph and to fix the dimension. Uh, you get my point? So last, <clears throat> last week after your talk, I have a question is that how given the graph, and the graph can be very large and the graph can be very slow, very small, and how to feed the graph into a neural model, which will usually only take fixed lens input, take input of the fixed lens or fixed dimension, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, they actually fix the dimension of K, right? Yeah. So can you provide the meaning of <clears throat> why they're going to apply two singular value compositions to, to derive the K? Mm. Why not choose the others? And the why, and the what's the meanings of these k times k matrix means? Mm. Okay, maybe maybe you can keep these questions in your mind and let Rovan finish. Then probably there will be a clearer, um, clear clearer uh, explanations after Rovan. Okay, Rovan, please go on. Hmm. So a uh, geometric interpretation for spectral decomposition theorem is that uh, now we, the theorem says that A is equal to some linear combination of gamma I, gamma I transpose. So if A is multiplied by X, then we are essentially having a linear combination of gamma I, gamma I transpose times X. And what is this thing is that this term is trying to project x onto the gamma i direction. So ax projects x on all its eigenvectors. And eigenvectors now are just like some kind of basis. Like in two-dimensional space, we want to find a new x axis and a new y axis. Then for any vector, we project it onto this coordinate system. Okay, I think it's supposed to be no problem to understand these slides and keep going on. And of course, those are basics and the foundation mm -hmm. are important. Mm, I suppose everyone here is supposed to understand this, keep going on. Mm. If you follow carefully, to this tutorial, you may notice that the spectral decomposition and eigenvectors are only defined for square matrix. But what, what if we have a general matrix, which is non-square? Do we have some similar concepts? Um, the answer is yes. The, for non-square matrix, we have singular values instead of eigenvalues. We have singular value decomposition instead of spectral decomposition. Um, so given any matrix A, we can view it as a transformation. And we apply A onto all vectors of unit length. If we want to find the first stretching axis for A, we are essentially solving, solving this optimization problem. We want to maximize the length of AX subject to the length of axis one, because we want to find the direction where stretching strength is the maximum. So, uh, For example, you look at this oval, then we observe that U1 is the maximum compared to, uh, compared to, so this is the maximum compared to this vector and all the rest vector lying on the oval. Okay, I, I'm trying to ignore comments on your talk and you can keep going mm -hmm. on. And also I encourage other students to ask because the basics are very important. And uh, even I sometimes will miss the details, lose the insight, missing the details somehow means that I may lose the insights. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to ask Rofan. And uh, I suggest Rofan, you can a little bit slow down. I'm not sure, not, I'm not sure, everyone can 
and follow some of the some equation heavy. So the, sometimes the one slide says heavily involved a lot of equations. You can slow down a bit for them for people to ask. Oh, uh, is is this is this optimization clear to you? Me? Yeah. Yes, I'm clear about this. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. And this can be solved by Lagrange multiplier method. The objective function becomes, we will just expand this uh, square L2 norm in terms of matrix form. And then we add the Lagrange multiplier term lambda times x transpose x minus one. This is this is equal to zero, so so we can add it into the optimization function. Mm. Then we take partial derivative of L with respect to x to solve for x. And now we let the partial derivative equal to zero. We can have a transpose ax is equal to lambda x. So this may be very familiar to you because this is the just the eigenvector definition. Then if we plug this equation back to L, we will get L is equal to lambda. So to maximize L, we are essentially maximizing lambda. So the best x is just the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue for A transpose A. Okay, keep it going on. Similarly, we can find the second stretching axis, which maximizes the, the same optimization problem, but with additional constraint, and it should be perpendicular to the first stretching axis. Then it turns out that the stretching axis for A is just AV1 up to AVM, where V1 up to VM are eigenvectors for A transpose A. And singular values are defined as the length of stretching vector which is the square root of the eigenvalues for A transpose A. Uh, I, I have uh, one question here. Mm. So you mean A is singular? Um, A is a uh, non-square okay. matrix. So it's singular, right? Uh, according to rule of definition, singular matrix. Oh, oh singular I remember. Square matrix. So you can only think this is not a square matrix. It's not a square, a square matrix. So um, uh, suppose the, um, we have n rows and m uh, columns. Do you have requirements for uh, like n should uh, greater than m or? Vice versa. Huh? Or vice versa or? or, or so as long as n. As long as it's not uh, a square matrix, it's okay, right? Yeah, as long as it's a. Uh, okay, okay. Mm. Um, and for non square matrix, we use single value decomposition. The format is very similar to spectral decomposition, except that the, the middle middle matrix is not full rank because uh, A can be any matrix and it is not square. So it is not a full rank matrix and the rank R may not equal to the number of rows or the number of columns. So there will be redundant columns or redundant rows. So we can only find um, uh, R non zero eigenvalues for A transpose A. And then we take the square root to form this gamma, to form this lambda R matrix. And O is a matrix with all zeros. And now the left-hand side matrix P and the right-hand side matrix Q are no longer identical. Uh, let's say well, what is P and what is Q. Q actually are formed by the eigenvectors of A transpose A 
and P are formed by a set of column vectors where each column vector is equal to the normalized version of AVI. Remember that AVI is just our stretching axis. And since A is equal to this, and if we expand it, we can have a linear combination of UI and VI transpose. Then AX can be expressed as a linear combination of uh, of AVI, VI transpose X. And this term just projects AX onto the stretching axis for A. So single value decombination is very similar to spectral decombination because both of them just project my AX onto the two stretching dimension. So both theorems are actually talking about the same thing. The first thing is that we can find the orthogonal stretching dimension for all kinds of transformation, square matrix or non-square matrix. The second thing, we can find the stretching strength for each stretching dimension. And this stretching strength is defined as eigenvalues for square matrix and singular values for non-square matrix. The third thing is that we can view a transformation as a projection onto stretching dimensions. The fourth thing, spectral decomposition is just a special case of, F of SVD where A is asymmetric. Hmm. Hmm. So intuitively thinking, so the decompositions, as long as we want to find the, how about, so the principal component of the matrix yeah. is not necessary to be the spectrum decompositions. And then the matrix does not need to, it does not, the matrix is not, is not required to be full rank or it's not even required to be uh, square. It is still possible that we do some principal analysis just like SVD do, right? So SVD is more generalized the form. Mm. Okay, mm. what's going on? So this is the summary. Given a matrix, we first check whether it's square or not. For square matrix, we have eigenvectors or eigenvalues. For non-square matrix, we have singular values. Um, if it's a square matrix, we then check whether it's symmetric or not. For symmetric matrix, we can do spectral decomposition. If it is not symmetric or it is a, not a square matrix, then we do singular value decomposition. Um, but, but why spectral decomposition or singular decomposition is useful? Let's look at one of its most famous application called principal component analysis. Recall that PCA is trying to find directions to project my data points on. And these directions are where the data points vary the most. And also this direction should be perpendicular to each other. Here is an example of PCA. Mathematically, PCA is doing spectral decomposition on the sample variance of matrix on sample variance matrix S instead of the original data matrix S. Um, the eigenvectors for S are the principal component directions. To reduce the dimension, we only select top K eigenvectors corresponding to the highest top K eigenvalues as principal component because they are the most important ones. Um, so, so let me explain. Given a data matrix X, which is of this form. So each row is one observation. And we have P columns because we may have P features in total. But we believe that these P features are not independent. So there may be redundant features. So we want to reduce P features into K features. Each new feature is a linear combination of old feature. Z1 up to ZK are my new features. So each Z is expressed as a linear combination of old features. But now we want to compute what are the best phi 11, 
what are the best five here? A principal component direction is good. We conserve how data are spread in the space. So my Z is good when it has very large sample variance. Why, for example, we project all my data points onto the first, first principal direction. Then my data points becomes Z11, uh, Z21, up to Zn1. If my sample variance of Z is large, then the data points are well spread on the first principal component direction. So this direction can well capture how the data is varying. So we want the Z value to be of large yeah. variance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. So now if we focus on finding the first principle, so AC, we can also think about this angle angle. We can think about entropy. So the larger the larger the variance, mm. the larger the entropy. So we want the first component to have as much information as possible. Yes. Then we go with the second, the third, and the vice, and, and so on. Mm. 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 Yeah, because our goal is to capture all the variance, all the total variance in our data. So we want our principal component to capture as much variance as possible. Mm. So my point is, variance is more so yeah. equivalent to the information yeah. amount. Mm. Mm. And now my optimization problem becomes, I want to maximize the variance. And we will add a constraint here because we want to get unique solution. So we want to control, control the uh, linear combination coefficients to, to be of uh, L2 norm of one. And here you can see that this Z average disappear because uh, usually before doing PCA, all our data metrics are centered around zero. So this Z bar is equal to zero. Then we can simplify our variance in Z as just the square of Z I one. And uh, we can expand Z as combination of X I. Then we will find that the sample variance of Z is just equal to this. And we know that the sample covariance of our data matrix is in this form. So we can replace this XI, XI transpose as the data matrix capital S. Then we incorporate the constraint that phi one transpose phi one is equal to one, which means that the coefficient vector is of length one. Then we do, then we repeat uh, then we utilize the Lagrange multiplier method again here and solve this optimization problem. This optimization problem is the same as the one we solved in to find the singular value. So we can find that phi one is just the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue of sample covariance matrix capital S. And similarly, we can find second principal component, third principal component, and so on. It turns out that the K principal component directions correspond to the K eigenvectors of capital S with the largest, with, with the K largest eigenvalue. Then once we find the principal component directions, we can just project the original data points onto the directions and obtain new features Z1 up to ZK. So here are the main steps in PCA. First, we need to find the covariance matrix S for data matrix X. Then we get the eigenvectors for S. These eigenvectors can fully extract the information in S. Then we select top k eigenvectors as the 
coefficients for the k principal component and project x onto principal component dimensions to obtain z. Z is our new data matrix. On here, I, I have listed another application, which is to solve generally square estimation. If you are interested, you can take a look. Yeah, it's almost like a professor's tutorial. Yes, very excellent talk. And I, so I, Yijue, hello. Yijue, Yijue, well, sorry, Yihao, Yihao here. Yeah. So do you think you can answer the question? Ropan, will you please go to the previous slide? And the previous one, the previous one. Yeah. So have you given the, the, the hint or clue for, on these slides? Can you answer my the question just now? So uh, originally the the matrix represents the data flow in the program mm -hmm. and it is embedded in that uh, but the paper the paper wants to um, use a uh, uh, k uh, a k length vector to um, to represent the matrix the m by m matrix so they they use SVD to uh, project the n by n matrix into k uh, orthogonal uh, yeah, k principal okay. component directions. Yeah, yeah. So, so the point is that they want to keep as much information as possible. So that is their intention rationale. Okay, good, good answer. Oh, Rofan, maybe you can take a few minutes to 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 conclude. Yeah. Mm. So the takeaway from this tutorial is that you can see that SPD is very useful when we want to find some low rank matrix approximation. Suppose we have a very complex data matrix X, but we believe some of its features are redundant or correlated. By decomposing X into eigenmatrix, the column vectors in my eigenmatrix are new feature direction, and the number of new features are less than the original number of features. And also these new features are independent. So they are maybe when the features are independent, they are very helpful when you want to do some further analysis, like uh, explain some of the features, etc. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. So I have additional questions for you. Mm -hmm. So all the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, SVD composition are based on the linear decompositions. So there are still some applications, for example, Xiaoning is working on for some, uh, basically Xiaoning is working on the solutions which can um, compress information even more within some linear, non-linear transformations like for, um, such as the neural network model to, to nonlinear uh, transformations. And what is opinions and what is considerations for those nonlinear composition and not for those nonlinear decomposition? Mm. Consideration. Yeah. So I think for these linear decompositions, and all of them are with a beautiful theoretical <coughs> group mm. there. And for nonlinear, for, for those linear decompositions, usually it is more diamond, more domain specific. We do not have a specific proof for whether we can do the reductions. And for now, the PCA is actually a very <coughs> classical, um, mm. very classical um, dimension reductions. And we will make sure that after the reduction, giving the k values, we will make sure that the <clears throat> with the constraints of linear on um, transformations, the information is kept as much mm. as possible based on the constraints of linear mm. uh, transformation. But given the nonlinear transformations, they might suppose to be other theoretical proofs, but I'm not mm. quite sure about this, to mm. make sure that the information is, is kept as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And for yeah. the giving Xiaoning's work based on their large nebula dimensions, the dimension mm -hmm. of um, 2000, 2000 dimensions, we're going to squeeze into a two dimension. So, how mm -hmm. much are going to make a trade off? So, might be there's an interesting uh, theoretical insights here. Mm -hmm. so we have mm -hmm. 
But from this talk, we can recap from what the linear transformation did, and those are basic. Maybe you can get some insights. If you have other questions, maybe you can talk more offline. This talk has already been taken on almost one hour. So mm. I have to stop here and uh, thanks Rofan for his um, good talk. Mm. So the next one, how about how about Wang Chao? Hello, Wang Chao. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Mm. And compared to, so you can see about the civilizations. I'm, I'm going to talk about the civilizations. So what what presented by Ruofan is actually the course in under, course, undergraduate course, right? I assume almost every one of us has learned it. But frankly speaking, when I when I when we go through the papers from the papers reported by Ni Xiangling and Wang Chao are supposed to be developed by some PhDs. But we would find that the annual course is usually more heavy than the knowledge is discovered by PhDs. So sometimes we sometimes sometimes when we are working for, for the PhD level a little bit, sometimes we will recap for those undergrad and kind of fundamental theories that will be also helpful for us to get more insight for our own research. Okay. Uh one time please going on. Okay, so today I will present a paper named Apricot, and it is a weight adaptation approach to fix uh, to fixing uh, deep learning models, and um, it's it's on the uh, ASE twenty nineteen, and it's by Zhang Hao and uh, Chang Wing Kong mm. uh, for the author, and uh, they are both from City University of Hong Kong, and also from Department of Science. And for Zhang Hao, the area he works on is multimedia event detection and video content analysis. Uh, for Chang Wing Kong, uh, his area is software engineering, program analysis, and uh, software engineering for deep learning. And uh, the terminology, uh, so it's, it's actually very basic. Uh, so deep learning model, so it's a short term, uh, DM, DLM, the short term for deep learning model. So it's just stands for a deep neural network. And IDLM, so it's the input deep learning model. So it is a, oh, sorry, it's not module, it's model to repair. So RDLM, uh, so it's a resultant reduced deep learning model that shares the same structure with IDLM, but it's only trained using a subset of whole training data set. So which means here is that after have a model to repair, the RDLM is got from IDLM by only training half, or not, sorry, not half, so only a subset of the whole training data to get this RDLM. So the weight is a learnable parameter of deep learning model, and the T0 means the original training data set. So I think uh, it's quite clear in this uh, slide. So the motivation for that paper is that, so if a deep learning architecture of a deep learning model is trained over many different subsets of the original training data set, the weight in the resultant DL model can provide insights on the adjustment direction and the magnitude of the weights in the original deep learning model. And this, so this, uh, what this weight can be used to handle the test case that the original DL model misclassifies. Here are uh, so, the questions for. So, would you please illustrate more about the ways of the resultant reduced DL models can provide insight? And what is that kind of insight? And this slide. So, the, kind, the insight is very simple. So, they just. Uh, so, actually, I will talk about it. The details later in the details. So, uh, so the I, the motivation is just that it can provide some insight, right? So the insight is actually that it will use the average of the correct input weights as a direction to to uh, make the original model to go to that direction so that it can make a more credit more correct prediction. So it's for example, I have a weights uh, that's one. And the resultant 
a reduced DL model is two and three. So there are two result reduced models which can pr predict quick correctly for this data. So maybe this two and three gives um, direction and the magnitude of the ways to update. Like I would actually move one to 1.5 or even two to make the model to, pre to predict correctly. Uh, is that answer your question, Nimi? Yes, so I'm asking, so giving the one, two, three are on the same weights of the model. Yeah, it's on the same weights. So, so the point is that if we train a whole data set, the training process is a little bit um, difficult, a little bit challenging. But if we only train a subset of models, maybe some data set can be predicted well. So giving yeah. side or giving these partial solutions, we can provide some things and feedback to the original, the whole whole pack of the model. Yeah, correct. Okay. So, so uh, I think so, it's kind of clear in the rationale. So um, I'm only asking by Rof and Xiangling, and are you clear with this rationale? I'm not sure whether I have explained myself with it, but I have a question. I confirmed with Wang Charles, but the problem in the communication is that I think I understand. Wang Chao think I understand, but I'm not sure my understanding is the same with the understanding Wang Chao believe I understand. So I suppose you ask more of your students to, to make sure the communication is smooth. Um, okay, maybe I can ask a more direct questions. Uh, Xiangling, are you yeah. right here? Xiangling. Mm -hmm. So would you repeat uh, the rationale? And also maybe you can mm -hmm. press the rationale you have understood based on these slides. I'm not sure I quite understand, but do you mean if you have a model trend on the whole training data set and you have a different model trend over, trend on different subset of the data set? Uh, maybe I can explain mm -hmm. myself, make sure that I understood what Yang Hong, oh, sorry, Wang Hong. <laughs> so here is, a, here is a model one. So this here is the models. The model has a challenge to predict. Actually, I, actually, I have an image here for the whole process. So okay, please go on. So, so you can see that originally we have a so there's the or, original DLM. So it's a model input. So it will first go over the train data set T zero. So the original data set to have the train IDLM data uh, D zero, and for all other resultant DLM, so which are DLM. They are trained only using a subset of training data set T is T1. So now we have several models. So with so these several models with same uh, structure, but different weights, right? So uh, for given one training sample, uh, each of these models will give a unique output, right? For example, correct, 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 wrong, 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 or wrong, correct, 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 or something like this. So in the case that the trained IDLM is outputting incorrect, incorrect prediction, but the sum of the resultant DLM is output correct predictions. This, in such case, that the weight of, of uh, in, inside such resultant DLMs can give some hints or the insights how we should modify the original uh, IDLM, the weight in the original IDLM to make the prediction correct. Mm. Is that clear to you? I think it's fairly clear. And okay. But do you think the rationale is sound? Uh, I, actually, I, uh, it's not so, it's always a problem. How can we ensure that modifying it won't affect the. Sometimes that somehow makes sense, but from my gut feelings, it's not that simple. And how the clue can be represented. Is, and yeah, so the uh, issue is always that how can we prove that such modification won't affect those correct predictions? Yeah, so just like that, just like what we discussed our work now, that we would like to introduce a change. We would like to make sure the change can fix the problem while not introduce new problems. All right. So that's one of the major doubts of the work done in this paper because. Actually, uh, if you recall what I've mentioned in the WeChat, so I so in here actually in the adaptation phase, it always uh, it actually adds another 
uh, let me. So actually, after one round of fixing, actually, actually introduce one extra training set, uh, training step. So this train step will actually use the whole data set to train again. And the author said that it will can somehow uh, retain the feature for uh, weights for those correct inputs. But this will also raise a question that will the re this retrain step, uh, so it's actually the weight adjustment step in, in the, uh, in the so it's actually doing the work or the tra retrain step doing the work is unknown because the uh, process is actually, uh, so the training phase is fixed, so it's, it's no, no problem, it's simple. And then in the adaption phase, as after one round of adaption, it will actually go through one training phase again, and then go, going around another adaption phase and the train again. So, and then finally, it will get the result. It's not very empirical. And there's no guarantee, you know, proof here. Yeah, so actually, there's no guarantee that it's the training. Uh, so it can be uh, very hard to differentiate if the training actually do the improvement or the weight adjustment do the improvement. Because it, another step, it, uh, so, another one, uh, so another work it takes is that, uh, so uh, sorry, I didn't talk, include the pseudo code. So actually it's also uh, in, add uh, another step that it will, uh, use the test score to keep. So for example, after one round of weight adjustment and retraining, it will try to do the test. And if the test score is higher than the previous one, it will keep the new model. Otherwise, the current best is kept. The issue here is that uh, although we get, make, get a better model than to have a better test score, however, we do not know it's the, it's the weight adjustment that makes the one give a better training uh, testing score. Maybe a similar to us. So we can train the models with Adam to your step, right? So if the model has been converted with the Adam training process, it means that the model cannot exceed the Adam, cannot, cannot, be, cannot be improved further with existing tools. Then we adopt this approach and um, we have repeti we repetitively apply weight adjustment and the retraining process. At the least, means that uh, when if we can get some new good results, it means that somehow the weight adjustment plays some role there. Yeah, but actually, the retraining process will even there's no adjustment and run the item again. Maybe in one hundred approaches. It approaches it will get some improvement, and another one hundred approaches it will get some improvement. Imp improvement but the improvement is is uh small but so it's very hard to say uh so it's the training or the weight adduction plus training to the work because it, so it, the baseline it, uh, use is not very uh clear that it compare with all the ways to so so it does not control the variable in the experiment i got a point so Let's keep going on and talk yeah, about- so I will, I will introduce the process now. So the last part is quite simple. So we, we have our original model and then we do the step, we do the training for several sub data sets. Then we will go to the adaption phase. So in this adaption phase, so for all the data in the training data set batch, it will find the one, all the set of correct predict models, like in all, all the RDMs, and the, all the set of incorrect predict models are called this sub, sub data. And based on the average weights set in this model and the average in this model, it will do the weight adjustment. After getting the adjustment IDLM, it actually it will run some training step again, and then to see if the test data is, mm -hmm. uh, high, high, uh, test result is higher or not. If higher, keep it, and then go to another iteration. It's if not applied on a training set, right? The whole process only apply on a training data set. Yeah, so it's the, the data is from training data set, but, to, but the criteria to keep the model is on the testing data set. Oh, sorry. So the criteria to keep the models on a testing data set. 
So yeah. we're using test data for training using that cheating. So it's it's actually a kind of pollution of data because although the model does not see the data directly, but we use it. So a better way to do it is actually doing this on a validation data set and then trying to do the testing result. But uh, actually, maybe introducing validation data set might be a good idea. Mm. Yeah, so in a normal way, we usually divide the test into the real test and the validation and to do the parameter tuning or model keeping on this validation data set and then try to evaluate the test, right? So, but but since we are doing the um, model repairing, so it's very hard to say it's a bad choice to use the test data set to directly because anyway, the, the goal is to improve the test accuracy, but right? as long as it can improve test accuracy. Although the data is a kind of polluted, but yeah, it's still acceptable, yeah. Let's keep going on to see how the way just the details of okay. But I, I have a question here. So okay. Wang Chao, you yeah. said um, it's hard to tell whether it's the retraining process or the weight adjustment that um, makes the accuracy higher, right? Yeah. So why don't they just they can do two experiments, one uh, with weight adjustment and retraining process, and the other one only contains um, the retraining process and compare those two. Yes, that's what they can do, but it's not, the result is not included in the paper. So um, that's why I say that. We I, my point is here, my point is as follows. So, but also Wang Chang has have some counter arguments on they must have a baseline. The baseline is supposed to be the original training process, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so if the data is the original training process, so it's going to run the baseline and have the accuracy. As long as the baseline confirms, sorry, as long as the baseline converge on the data set, and that's their base accuracy. And for this approach, it's always, because the baseline has the retraining process, right? The 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 training, um, the tra re retraining for what? Well, let's talk about the retraining being the repeti repetitively. Actually, the baseline do not have retraining process, so they actually just take the test accuracy as the uh, Origi original DLM as the baseline, and uh, the one get get the the final output as another one to compare with original DLM. So I just I just have a quick comment for these slides, and actually move on. So my gut feeling is that the waste adjustment will just have a right. Suppose let's let's think about the training the models as a search process. Suppose this is a search process, and the original models original model actually are trapped in the local optimization or local optima, and the waste adjustment somehow provide a somehow provide a a jump, a shortcut, uh, maybe I'm writing some suppose. Yeah, this may, this may also be true. Right, so suppose, uh, let me write something here. Uh, suppose this is local optima, and this is a global optima, assuming it's here. So this weight adjustment, suppose we're using add-ons to, to train the models, and it, it is local, it, the, the local optima is here, as, even if we change the learning accuracy, uh, learning rate, we change the hyperparameters to three here. And this weight adjustment is using some heuristics to make a shortcut to be here. And these weights may introduce some regression. The regression means that we some samples predict well, cannot be well predicted anymore. But starting from this point, we may jump out of the local optima, jump out of the trap, and as when we start training on this on these positions or on this speed, we can we can reach a better uh, model here. Uh, better. Yes, that's also one assumption or that or one, uh, one yeah, it's a one reasonable explaining of the rational, yeah. Okay. So and so I'll next I'll go to the next step to show the step more in a more clear way. Mm, okay. Oh, sorry, I, also, I might lose some points here, so I have one more question. Okay. You mean, yeah. um, um, you mean, do you mean uh, that they will go through the whole training data set and use the test accuracy as the measurement? Yeah. Or they, they only, huh? 
they use oh. the test accuracy as a measurement, but they all they did not see that they yeah do the training program. The test the test data set is on here. The test accuracy is here. Oh, but here they need some given input to calculate the accuracy. The input is training data or testing data. Uh, the in input is training data only. So the, the data used to fix the model is only training data. Okay, okay. But to evaluate, they use test accuracy to evaluate mm -hmm. the model. That's fine. Okay. So just make sure there's no overfitting problem. Please go on. Thanks. Okay, so, so next. So the first is quite simple. So uh, as I think the graph itself should explain it quite well. So, so it will split the data set in, uh, into sub-train data set. And uh, for each for each subset, it will, will copy the structure and uh, do the training. So I will uh, skip this. And uh, for the second part, so first we will have a train data set and then we will have a training batch. So each, so each batch has contains some number of training samples. That's where they do the iteration. And then for each, they will actually, they will do it for each train sample. So it will first determine whether the train sample gave the, uh, have a correct output for the original data. If it's correct, then it's, there, must, there are no need to fix them, right? So if wrong, if it will, it will go to the next step. So it will see if it can be fixed or not. So it can be fixed or not means here, is there any model here? So if the, there's zero models in the correct submodels, means that there's no weight, no, no weight directions to give the guidance. So it will just go through the next, go through the next, next sample means that, oh, this model cannot be fixed. But if it has, it will go to the next iteration. Mm -hmm. so, so it will do the weight adjustment. So firstly, it will record the weights. And for the recording of weights, it's just averaging all the weights in the correct sub models and also averaging the weights in the incorrect sub models called correct weights and incorrect weights. Then it will also compute the correct diff and incorrect diff means the, the distance between the two weights. So doing, after doing this, it will do the weight adjustment. So the weight as so the detail of weight, weight adjustment will be next, but basically it will so it have several strategies to uh, do weight adjustment based on this correct diff and incorrect diff. So the detail will in the next next step. So after it gets it will actually go to the retraining step, and uh, go after retraining it will do the evaluation and to see if the model worth keeping or not. This is so, very clear. Anyone have a question here? No. Okay. Hmm. So, for the weight adjustment strategy, actually the uh, the author tried three strategies. So for WK means that the weights in case iteration, and RL means the R learning rate. So it's an adjustment rate, and P P correct P incorrect means the portion of correct or incorrect RDMs in all the RDMs. So for for example, it have twenty RDMs and the five of them are correct. The other 15 are incorrect, so p correct will be one over four, and uh, p incorrect will be three over four. So that's the portion of the model that is correct or incorrect. So then you can see that the weight ad weight ad adjustment is quite simple. It's just Very times simple. the yeah. learning rate times the p proportion times the diff. So it's uh, actually three strategies. So in the first strategy, it will consider both the Wrong, uh, correct, correct predict, so and the wrong predict. That's supposed to be the best one, right? Because it contains. No, actually, it's the second to do the best. In the in its so experiment, actually, the second to do the best. Experiment means that it, it only considers the correct input. Mm. So the incorrect is not. Uh, so actually, all three what, can give. Similar to what we discussed, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. incorrect, we never know the direction to be correct. Correct. And if we know it is correct, we have a direction to want to be. For example, let's have a guess. One to 100, you have a correct guess. So if you say 
See if you guess it is three, I say it's wrong. But you, you, you have no idea whether the correct answer should be smaller than three or bigger than three. And uh, suppose you have a guess like it is 54 um, or 55. So you will have direction. So you just move towards the, the correct direction of the 54 or 55, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the same with the with the, our findings. Yeah. So the weight selection part, so the paper people actually do not have any weight selection part. So it simply use all the weights in the model to update. So yeah, that's what the paper. I have do. Uh, questions here is that how they divide the batch. So you can see there's the suppose the batch is 50k uh, training sample. And how we divide it to the extreme case, yes, I divide into 50k batches. And each training set and how they once in both, I can definitely be correctly predicted. Right? But it makes no sense. And I suppose to the look to another extreme, they only have one bench. So what if it has, has only one batch, it also makes no sense. Because it must be somewhere in between. And uh, it, do they do the experiment or try different batch to see their experiment. No, they, yeah, that's also the one point I want to criticize. So actually all the hyperparameter choose in that paper are only set with, they randomly choose this parameter. They randomly choose parameter, like all the batch num or the, so the, like the, yeah, so that's one very bad. So actually it did not do experiment on the, that's, also, the, you have to poach them to retrain. I feel, I feel, I feel that if we're planning for an SE conference, maybe this is all baseline. Because they, this approach, we can maybe implement some of them to see the set. Because the you know, setting is very similar to us. We're only trying to fix the overfitting problem, right? They are, all, they are trying to fix the overfitting uh, underfitting problem. Both, are, both of us is going to fix the over underfitting problem and we're looking to the reference model and they're looking to the uh, divided data set. Yeah, so actually, so the, the whole data set is five, 500, uh, sorry, 10, five, uh, 50, 000, but it's training batch is only 20 and one training sample is one, right? So actually it have mm -hmm. uh, such number of training batches and it also says that for each batch, it needs to retrain for 20 approaches. So it actually retrain such number of huge number of times for the original model. So that's when it's quite unaccept unacceptable com compared to the mo model to or we have, we, we, we have XPD clusters, we can do, do this, oh, no worry. But we have, sometimes we need to find it if it's a baseline. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of unacceptable to run this number of a uh, number of it iterations. Is, they open open source to their. Uh, no, there is, it's not, not not open source. I have searched yes. through. Uh, Would you please through. take a note here? We would like to write an email for them. Ask for their source code. Ask for their data. If you have used some open data, it's fun. But we need to. You say that we are from AUS. We are interested in investigating their approach. Uh, and I think the last professor is in Hong Kong City University. So it's supposed to be a uh, well done in the prestigious, you know, prestigious professors. And giving this paper, it has only two authors. So you can just email both of them and ask for their source code. Yeah, but yeah, and usually I, uh, they will not give the source code. Yep, they uh, they not if, they, if, I, if we got the email that they were not, um, we are going to implement the or if we implement our own, the baseline may not be so difficult to outperform. Yeah, the implementation part in this one is kind of easier, so a little bit easier compared to the modes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but actually, they did not give the hyperparameter that is. No yeah. worry, we can find multiple hyperparameters our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is how they adjust this. So, um, actually, so they use five CN models. So next is the experiment part. So that's a model they choose. So it use five models, 
uh, Pepsin models. In the first three, it you contains the best norm, uh, global uh, average pooling and the residual layers. So that's all mainly the one. But actually, their models are all kind of overfitting models. So you can see the average training accuracy and the average testing accuracy. So basically, they all reached a very high training accuracy already. And uh, some, yeah, that's. That's uh, so here's the original they set all their this is there this is original they said right original yeah this is the or, or, original model and the model the performance of our original model and the problem is that they have an overfitting problem yes so their approach is going to address overfitting problems by training the so actually, it's very hard to say it's overfitting or underfitting because um, for overfit, so yes, indeed, they get a very high accuracy in the, yeah, it's, it's, we can classify them as an overfitting problem, but uh, usually we have a very high. So here, here, here this, your, your answers will change my decisions because you provide different information. Our problem is going to working on over, Underfitting, yeah. And that means on the training set, it's not, not trained well. But they are working on the overfitting problem. So they are two di very different problem set problem settings. So what is the argument? So overfitting and underfitting. Mm, it's better to classify them as an overfitting problem because. Uh, the model it used already have the potential to recognize all the models. Uh, sorry, all the... Yeah, I just gave the experiment and seeing that the model has already done quite well on the training data set. The problem is we need to fix their testing data. But it becomes very hard to say how they're going to generalize their approach. And I didn't see any technique to generalize their model. They just use their approach to and would you please go back to the previous slide? I have few questions to clarify. This yeah. one? Yeah, and this approach are all, all, are all are conducted on the training data set. Training data, yeah, correct. Training data set. And, uh, how, and, and this is the training samples. And yes. also how to work on whether it's correct or not. And yes. it becomes a bit weird that all of them are going to further improve the training accuracy. And the data, yeah. the data set is going to show there they are going to work on the testing to improve the testing accuracy. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. Yang Hong has some ideas. He wow. told me that this work is trying to fix the overfitting problem. So the, for example, you have the initial training model, but this model is kind of overfitting it can only predict some of the data as correct, but they will have some incorrect predictions. And this incorrect prediction, if we can train it to be correct, that will help the model to generalize on other kind of testing data. Really? But I believe the data set is the training data set. Don't be shy. You can emerge yourself and present your, express your idea. Um, Yang Hong is. Yang Hong. Hello, Yang Hong. <laughs> we cannot hear you, but that is fine. Um, I think Yang Hong thinks that the incorrect training set has some different distribution than the correct training set. So if we focus on fixing those incorrect ones, that help to improve the generalization ability of the current model. Mm. Mm. So you can see that the, for X batch, Y batch, in get batch, train X, train Y. So I'm very sure that the model uses the training data to fix it. Uh, so, so, yeah, uh, so, uh, because, uh, I, I got, I got Rofan and, and Yang Hong. Yeah. I think Rofan convey uh, Yang Hong correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Yang Hong, I think Rofan has fully conveyed your idea, but you're a little bit new to, to your, do not have my telephone. The idea is that, uh, let me rephrase, let me rephrase Yang Hong's point. So there are some part of the training 
so if we would like to improve the testing accuracy, um, some of the training data is supposed to be learned, supposed to be learned where we should learn some training samples where a, should better predict some have a better prediction some, on some training samples, not the others, so that we can generalize it better. So if there's a compromise. Suppose the training accuracy is ninety nine percent. And we are focused on too much, we focus too much on some parts. But yes. if we can make a compromise and mm -hmm. sacrifice the accuracy of, of, of the training sample on A and to improve the training samples on B, mm -hmm. and we will be able to maybe we will drop the drop the training accuracy from 99% to 97 percentages, but it yeah. will improve the testing. Can we improve the testing accuracy? That yeah. is uh, your whole point. So yeah. that, that means that we make a, make a sacrifice between A and B. Mm. However, uh, for this approach, I feel that there is no technical design for such a sacrifice. Right. There is no, no, no such a sacrifice. Of course, we will move on this part. Um, but there's still a retraining, but, but the mm. model still ab adopt a retraining process. And this retraining process will not allow us, even if this approach, even if, even if these form, four formulas actually make a sacrifice, on, we have make a sacrifice from A to B, mm. but after retraining, the B is back to A again. And we will not keep such a sacrifice anymore. Is that the point? But but now model can predict well um data set like B. So the testing accuracy will improve if the testing data is like B. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, so another but point it, is that another point is that if, if A has been oh, okay. So A A Wang Chang, so when they conduct this this process. The final stop, the stop epoch is using test accuracy, right? Uh, so yeah, use test accuracy to to they, they, change their models. Okay, they go through all the all the iteration, and they keep the best model with best the best, best accuracy. Yeah, on the, on the test accuracy. Mm. But still, some kind of cheating. Still, I feel a little bit cheating because. If that is the case, I can still train the models and then take and test the accuracy. Yes, yeah, so actually, in such case, such that then with the, the, the testing data set is polluted because actually, if we believe B is similar to D, so actually we are using the data in D to train the model. So actually, the data is polluted. It, it is not using test the data to train the model, but it uses test the accuracy as a measurement to stop. Mm -hmm. Mm. If you, it's not that cheating, it is a little bit cheating here. Yeah, so yes, I, I, I have already mentioned the, the way they use test accuracy as the stop yeah, criteria is think, kind of cheating. Yeah, let's go on, let's keep going on on these, uh, let's see how the data. So that's the original mod, so that's the uh, chain accuracy of the original model and the actual test uh, and the, the testing accuracy. Oh, by the way, I have one more comment giving Yang Hong's opinion. That is, the whole training set has been divided uh, into smaller data set, but the model parameter, the model weights, the number of model weights keep the same. And that is still a risk to introduce more overfitting problems, right? So the, the, the training sample, the, the number of training samples became smaller and the weights is still there, mm -hmm. the number of weights is still there. So it also, have a risk to introduce the overfitting problem. Uh, so actually, the idea behind the behind the, the way is that so a wide grief of incurring. No this is the last slide. Yeah, it's a, it's the last slide, but but it's also the one believe in the mentioned in the paper. So it, it says that a wide belief of incurring ill trained weights in a DLM that some inputs in trained data sets may conflict with each other i.e. the updating direction of parameter weights between two inputs or two batches of them may be opposite. Mm -hmm. So 
it's trying to say that so why we cannot get a very good model is that so actually the updating direction is not the same so they are cancelled so for example uh, there are two two uh, uh, let me so there are I get a point of I get your first point so to that point I actually can counter so for example the model weight here but the model weight so the model weight here can predict a and the model weight here can predict b but now it can predict none of them if we can predict a moving this direction can can increase the uh, model accuracy moving that this direction can also increase the distance between accuracy but uh, getting the model in the in the middle can not even predict A or predict B, so it's well, the prediction is zero. So that's what they believe. <sighs> so they do test accuracy evaluation per batch instead of per epoch. So as long as they find the test accuracy is higher in some approaches, uh, after some approaches, they keep the whole model. Yeah, that's the, that's the, it's not a takeaway, but the way I, yeah. You take your, this your takeaway. And yeah, that's my, my takeaway. So what, so, uh, so the belief is not written by me. So it's the belief is written by the author and it, there are the reps there, but I haven't taken it into the detail of this ref, but the, it's the, the author of this paper claims this belief and uh, that's what I take away from this. And uh, also, this is what they do during the evaluation of the, their process. I think here, if, uh, if, we, if we argue too much on or the task on this, uh, this work too much, it makes no sense. And I think we need to have a try and uh, implement on their uh, discovery. That will be the, the, the more um, practical way to understand this approach. And this makes a sense. This, this argument somehow makes sense, but how many of these cases? And if there's some counter, if there's opposite or all the ways of updating will be canceled out. Isn't the best way to, to improve the model architecture? Let's introduce more weights so that the weights can adapt to both A and B. Yeah. So that's the, if we, if that is the, the, the reason, their solutions might not be the best fit. I, from my point of view, the best fit is that we introduce more weights. Yeah, but so all the assumption here is we do not change the model structure, right? Okay, let's see the result. So the result is quite simple. So, so it just give a table. So this all, so they just give a table, something like like this table, and they so they I have mentioned that they have used three strategies. One six stretch one, stretch two, and stretch three, and this uh, average train accuracy after their strategy. So that's the gain of the test accuracy, and they found that the test accuracy. So so stretch two will give the best test test uh, test accuracy. Yeah. So their goal is not to improve the training accuracy. Yeah, it's the goal is improve test accuracy. I think. I just do a little the test accuracy. And if they are going to improve the test accuracy, if they are going to address overfitting, and have the, the, is there the baseline adopting some air two regularizations or drop off? No. They only mention the gain between the before their strategy and after their strategy. Mm. It is very well. But is there an improvement on their training set? So you we can observe some like like for the 0 0.99 right so previously it's only 0 0.09 so we can observe some training improvements yeah okay okay so maybe you can i think that's all right that's all yeah that's all that's one, all one, oh sorry the uh, one child uh presentation is very excellent it's super clear and the and the animations are well done it's a, it's a well done presentation. Uh, but for the formal work, I think that may be a baseline. It, I think it's supposed to be baseline in the SD community to look into. And uh, one of the uh, counter arguments from my point of view is that they control, they split the data, introduce the uh, overfitting risk, 
and that I was supposed to make things worse. But my point opinion may not be correct, which means need to be evaluated through the experiment. And yep. also, I didn't see Yahoo makes some points, but I'm really not sure if they're going to address the problem of all fitting. They're supposed to be the baseline. And the problem of the story is a little different. If they're working on the overfitting problem, they're supposed to be compared with the dropout approach uh, because their goal is to generalize the model instead of further improve their training examples, or to improve their training accuracies. But in the training process, they still think that all the pros are trying hard to push the testing accuracy even more. Uh, yeah, I still have some doubt here. I think overall, from my point of view, it is still an approach to address uh, the, to address overfitting problems. But given their results, their training accuracy has been already high enough. They turn on on the testing accuracy. Mm. Okay, that's all my point. All, all my presentation. And is there anyone have the questions here? Oh, if not, let's move on to Xiangli. This is our last uh, last presentations, and that is about the debugging. And for Xiangli's uh, presentation, is going to discover whether the training dataset has some bug or have some noise. So this is approach. Um, I forgot where it's published. Oh, triple AI. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at this research. Um, so the paper I'm going to present today is called Training Set Debugging Using Trusted Items. So it is published in Triple AI um, in 2018. Oh, and the authors are all from um, University of uh, Wisconsin Madison. And the first author is a PhD. Um, his research interests mainly focus on adversarial machine learning, robust uh, machine learning, and reinforcement learning. And the other two are professors from um, UW Madison. Mm. Um, so, uh, different from Montauk's presentation, he mainly focused on um, adjusting the weights to in, uh, improve the taste. Uh, Accuracy. This paper focuses on uh, finding the bugs in training set. That means um, those data that are mislabeled, like um, this, like the following example. So this could happen in reality, reality when people um, are not cautious about the labeling, and uh, they might um, um, misclassified. Mm -hmm. um, the label. So that means when you have a training data set, some of the labels might not be correct. So the goal of this paper is try, uh, tries to find those uh, mislabeled data. And here we need to um, notice that when there's a, there are some single outliners, um, it's very easy to detect. However, um, for those systematic bugs, like some bias, um, those are the bugs um, that are very uh, hard to detect. Um, so the challenges here, uh, we have two challenges. The first one is we have no machine learning debugging repository. Um, so that means in software engineering uh, research area, the debugging, usually we might have some uh, data set that tells you, um, um, like for example, in this work, um, if we have a training data set, we don't know um, which label are correct or which are not. So there's are no um, data set like this available. And the second challenge, just like um, I talk, what I talked about in the previous slide, the systematic box that um, much much harder to detect because of the data, uh, because the data appears self, uh, appear self consistent. Mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah, and so this paper actually proposed a normal uh, algorithm called duty debugging using trusted items, um, which could detect both outliners and systematic training set bugs. 
And in addition, it also can propose fixes, um, which, um, which means that it would um, gives you the correct label for the box. So how did they do that? Let's first look at one motivating example. So um, we need to first introduce the definition of trusted items. So the training set is usually too large for manual inspection, but um, researchers might have the resources to verify only a few trusted items. That means um, they could um, make sure those trust, trusted items have correct labels. So the set of trusted items may not um, be enough to um, for learning a new model, but they can be um, adequate for guiding uh, guiding the researcher to find those bugs inside the training data set. Um, so to do this, actually, Duty just utilized the knowledge of the trusted item, and uh, they try to find the smallest change to the original training set labels, such that um, when they train a new uh, a new model on the um, alternative training set, um, the new model could agree on the trusted items. So, so that's the uh, intuition here. So, so we can, uh, you need to keep your training model. Hmm? So the approach you need to, for example, they hmm. using the trusted items to flip the label um, of some, some other items or some other untrusted items. They will keep retraining the models on that? Oh yeah, when they um, altered the labels of the original training data set, they would train a new model on, um, on the revised training set. Okay. And the new model should agree on the uh, trusted items. Okay, so so here we the trusted we have a requirement for the trusted items. So the original model trend on those uh, contam contaminated data should not agree on the trusted items. Oh uh, yeah, I agree. So, but another follow-up question is that mm -hmm. when we are finding a bug, they must have some uh, phenomena or have some consequence for, for example, for the traditional program to say a bug because the program crashed, because the program's output has been unexpected. But for these scenarios, they say there's a bug in the items, in the training they set. What is the phenomena? And what will, what is the warning for us to look into the problem? Um, I don't think they, they address this problem um, in this paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it, because we can, for, um, you can look at the example in this slide. So um, this, this example um, is from Harry Potter movies. So the X and Y, because I haven't watched any of the Harry Potter movies, so okay. I, don't, I don't know the actual meaning, but um, the intuition is quite simple. So the true boundary is the red straight line. And uh, Right, so, so the true boundary is the y equals to 0 0.5 uh, line. Uh, but however, there are systematic bias um, on some data. Um, that is those data inside the ellipsoid circle. And so um, the black curve line is the uh, model that trend on those uh, uh, contam contaminated data set. So that's why um, uh, it's wrong. And uh, there are two trusted items in this example, the uh, red circle and the red um, plus sign. So they use those two trusted items to guide, um, to revise the training data set and find the minimum uh, revise of the label um, so that when they train on the uh, alternate alternative data set, um, the mod the model's boundary should lies on the true decision boundary. 
Okay. Yeah. So in the example. So, so the point is, uh, so let's let's forgot the problem. My previous my previous question. Mm -hmm. I think these problems may uh related to both you and Rolfan's work, and for you, the visualizations may also help to look into the mislabeled items. Suppose there's an item in our visualized two-dimensional space. It's very close to some where labeled the treasure items, but they're very close. So there's mm -hmm. my indicating the noise. And uh, for Rolfan's research, because Rolfan is uh, Rolf, Rolfan is working on a project, and uh, after his mm -hmm. project, and there he will understand another project of the applying active learning on object detection algorithm. Uh, so here is still the same problem that how do we mm -hmm. find the minimum, uh, introduce minimum uh, training samples so that it can bring more information mm -hmm. to change the model boundary. So here is somehow kind of relevant. Mm. Look into the problems and look and look at the details. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let's cl clarify um, what's the input for duty. So it should be the potential contaminated training set um, X and Y. And uh, suppose here we have N uh, examples of training data set. And we also have a, a few trusted items um, represented represent as tilde x and tilde y and uh, the ci should be the confidence score for um, the label uh, yi a uh, tilde yi so um, here we have m uh, examples the m should be um, less than n and we also have one learning algorithms the, uh, the machine learning model and in this work they focus on uh, ERM models which is uh, minimize regular light, regular right empirical risk minimizers so here theta is the parameters of the model mm. Mm. and uh, from the uh, motivated example actually here we can formulate um, this problem at this mathematical uh, formula. So what they're trying to do is they try to find the uh, minimum distance between y prime, uh, y prime and y. So y prime is um, the revised label. And uh, also it should subject it to um, the predictor should uh, agree on x and y prime. So the new training data set, and um, they should agree on the trusted. I have some confusion hmm? from here. Why is the uh, why is the, the predicted value? Uh, why is the label? Why the label? Mm -hmm. Because they try to um, change the label. They want to try to. Okay, the, so the, what, what is the distance between y prime and y and y prime, both y and y prime, uh, y, so if I'm, is that y is the label before the change and y prime is that after change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, they, uh, so why is it, okay, so the point is that they would like to minimize the change. Yeah, yeah, because we don't know the change now, so now we try to find the minimum change um, so after we uh, change the label, then um, the new predictor should agree on the trusted item um, as well as um, the revised training data set. Okay. The question is that the A is the, A, what does A mean? A is the model prediction? Uh, A, A is the model, yeah. A is the model. The model, the model trend on, the, the new model that trends on the training data set that we uh, revised. Mm. And uh, this x tilde means. X tilde is the trusted what, what item. Here, but there's no x here. Uh, that's not what? Uh, why is there the x parameter here, but not here? Because we don't need to change, because the problem is 
um, they define the bug as mislabeled items. So there's no, uh, the, the training set X has no problem, but Y um, is wrong. Okay, so they divide the training set. They, they only revise the label. Mm, so so what is so x and what's the difference if they only change the label then mm. what's the difference between x and x tilde? Oh, uh, x tilde is the trusted items new. Um, they introduce some new i um new new data. And so, uh, so, so the, actually, does, um, x, does x um, include x x tilde? No, no. Okay, okay, they are totally different. Um, there are the two. Uh, that that only means they they might ask some domain expert to um, yeah. manually label some new data as trusted items. Mm. So x and x tilders are exclusive. Um. Yeah. Um, and what's the difference of this equation and this equation? Uh, I don't see any difference. If we make sure um, the predictor is trained on x and y prime, then mm. yeah, there's no difference. Mm. And uh, intuitively, I believe that these equations is more like a hard constraint because the x tutors has been verified by human experts. Mm. And for this, this y, y prime, and uh, these are the they set under suspicion. So if I'm the one who designed the tools, we may, I may get, get different weights or priority to different they sets. Not sure whether they do the same job. Um, they they actually re relax this term. Um, we will talk about this. Um, okay. in, mm. Yeah, keep going on. So actually, in this paper, they only consider two kinds of models. One is regression model, and the other one is classification models. So let's first take a look at um, regression model. So in regression model, y prime and y are vectors in n dimension uh, in n dimensional space mm -hmm. and then they define the distance between y prime and y um, to be delta, uh, delta and also they denoted the predictor a as delta so um uh i <clears throat> let's first take a look at the um distance y prime and y so it can be uh, written in a form as, mm, as in, this. In yellow, oh, you in, in red, right? Yeah, in red, yeah, yeah. So, so gamma is just a weight and uh, they use L1 distance. Um, mm, yeah. Regression model, if it is a regression model, Y and Y prime is supposed to be uh, a continuous scalar. Why they will be okay? So each dimension it is a continuous value, right? Mm -hmm. So like uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.2, something like that. So this is supposed to, this is this is the prediction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So um, and let's look at the um, green box. So it can be written as um, this formula, so it, it, it's quite clear. Mm. And, and those red one, or this green one is supposed to be the hard constraint. Yeah, it's a hard constraint. Mm. And then uh, they relax the, um, the formula in black bo uh, blue box um, by the darkness loss function and place them in the objective. In the regression form. The Lagrange, right? Um, oh, look, look. Um, the Lagrange. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
why 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 is it why, why prime is just y i plus delta uh i understand so mm -hmm. as you can see the x tutor is the trusted item yeah and the y it is why the trusted items is not labeled as a other constraints and do they use another one using this label that's cut uh, as a hard constraint, the, the next label, because this is just suspicious, right? So this is the label. Mm -hmm. and the but um, they just read, um, in order to solve this um, optimization problem, mm -hmm. they- That still makes sense. So mm -hmm. assuming that we have to change these labels and how much those these constraints can be conformed. Mm -hmm. Such idea. Um, so yeah, on the right, actually, um, it is still a bilevel optimization problem. So we can first take a look at the lower level, um, lower level optimization problem. This um, this theta one. So this pro this optimization problem is strongly convex and uh, uh, unconstrained. So um, it can be, um, it can be um, replaced equivalently with this um, KKT condition. So we just calculate the um, gradient and uh, let it be zero. Let me think about it. The constraints is convex. Strongly convex. And what is the loss function? Sorry. So what is this loss function? The loss function of um, this regression model. Yeah, so what does this error mean? Sorry. Uh, is, I think, let me, let me check. So it's, um, let me comment. Oh, sorry. Will you please go back to the previous slide? Um, the the L is just y i plus delta um minus mm, uh let me think uh, I think it's x times beta so yeah. it's a re regression model yeah I'm sorry, will you please go back to the previous one? Mm -hmm. do, do you have a response a little bit? Mm. So, so the loss here, you can imagine is an MSE loss yeah. between predicted value and the ground truth value. The ground truth is just Y plus delta I. Mm -hmm. And the theta should be the kernel. Mm. So yeah. that's fine. Uh, okay, please go on. Mm. So the loss, so the whole optimization function is the uh, is convex. On um, the lower level optimization problem, mm. uh, the yes. omega beta is the is um, is the quadratic um, form. I understand it. Mm. Uh, let me think about let, let me see this KKT condition. Um. So because we try to find the minimum, uh, we, we try to find the beta that could minimize this formula. So, um, mm. so this condition just calculate so the, first the first optimize this condition. Hmm? Does it mean that we first optimize this condition? Yeah. And uh, we, we, then after we optimize mm. this one, then how about these two, this condition? Yeah. Let's look at this in the next slide. Okay. Oh, so after we um, get this condition, we actually have a relationship between theta and delta. So that means for any given delta, um, the theta is fixed, right? For any given delta, the theta is fixed. Fixed, oh, so the, the only one. Uh, 
assuming that you do a try different number of data. So that means there's a one to one mapping relation between the data. And so I just mean this formula defines the relation between delta and theta because okay. other variable are already yeah. known. Uh, yeah, you're right. Mm. So um, let's see how they um, <clears throat> solve this problem. So um, this one. Is our um, optimization objective, and uh, uh, given this um, fact, so this means um, the dl over d delta just means um, if we change delta, how much the l would be changed. Uh, l is um, suppose this is l, and the only um, one not hmm? so this equals to the right? The okay, not, not, not equal. Not equal. Why? So because in um uh because the delta and theta are the only not determined variables in this formula, and uh, we wanted to know if delta changed. How much L would change, mm. and then um, the um, um, the first term means um, the derivative of L with respect to delta, and the second one is um, when you first look at this one, um, it's the derivative of L with respect to theta, and we know there's a um, there's a relation between theta and delta. So those two add up to... Um, Why not they are the same? Hmm? Why not they are the same? So by right, it's using the chain rules. If this delta is if this delta, if this L is if this L, no matter what it is, these two items are equivalent. Um, I think the problem here is that if you change delta, you want to observe how much change in your total loss term, uh, mm -hmm. total optimization function term. Uh, if delta and theta are independent, then the change is just a partial derivative of L respect to delta, right? Mm -hmm. But now delta and theta are not independent. So when you change delta, your theta also change. So that's why you need to consider two terms. The first one is partial L, partial delta. The second one is um, how much change in theta, how, how much change in theta, and then you times the partial derivative of theta. We have two relations, theta yeah. is L, and it is actually come from both the theta and the delta. Yeah. And the theta is actually come from the delta. Yeah. This is a rule here. Yeah. Mm. So let me check it. Maybe I missed the equation here. So where is L? Let me put a point out something. Uh, L is just yeah. um, this op uh, optimization objective. Um, we can, this, this is DL over D theta. And uh, the D delta, right? The delta. Oh, the delta, yeah. And where is the DL? Uh, uh, so if, uh, if we look at this term, um, partial L over um, partial delta, then um, it's this term and uh, this term, right? So this part can contributed uh, to this and uh, this part contributed to this. So now we only look at the first term. Okay, let's keep going on. And then, oh. And then um, let's look at this part. So um, 
this part contributed to um, this part. So J, J is um, partial theta over partial delta. So first they calculate the um, partial L over partial theta and um, times J. And uh, let's, this one uh, contributed to this part. And uh, this, this is, um, and J is partial delta over partial delta. Is that um, clear? Hmm. I don't get the I don't get the skeleton, but it keeps going on. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So that's all. Now we um we can get the uh, dl over d delta. That means um we now know if we change delta um the of the objective. Oh, sorry. Let me refresh my, my words. So um, the delta is the distance of y and y prime, right? The, yeah. the change in label. And now we can get the gradient of this change um, to the objective function. Then they can use this gradient to do op op uh, optimization. OK, so suppose we have got such a delta so that um, DL can be optimize it and then and then they can find a delta that can minimize this objective function and that could be um uh so we can first look at the algorithm so um oh, please, uh, go on. Hmm? Hmm? please go on hmm. so first they would um initialize the gamma, and uh, then, sorry. So the input should be the training set, um, the potentially contaminated training set x, y, and the trusted uh, items tilde x and tilde y, and also their confidence score, uh, one learner a and one budget b. So b means when you get, uh, put when you find B box, then the program should stop. And then first they should initialize the gamma. And gamma just equals to the, um, when they set gamma to zero and del delta to be oh, zero. Sorry, sorry. So here, how do we define budget B? B is an input. Yeah, the point is that the B is never a bug, right? Oh, uh, yeah. The number of bugs, then how do I know how many bugs are there? Um, you don't know. So when they do experiments, um, they would set the budget to be different numbers and see um, the results. So here, uh, so here I still have the concerns about their assumptions. That is, they would like to change the minimum number of labels mm. so that they can uh, they can, so they can further improve on the prediction, right? Suppose I have a, I, I, I don't think that would both. improve the prediction. They only mm. um, try to make this changing data set um, um, and also I haven't, until now, I haven't clearly seen the mm the role, how the role of the trusted items play. I didn't see it. I think they almost play the same equivalency. So the, the trusted item. Um, and how does it, the, the trust, the role it play? It may have more ways when optimize the equations, but how, so suppose there's the trusted items. From my point of view, the trusted items must be well predicted. And they do not got the, the and their optimizations were not 
guarantee this one probably, right? Mm. They cannot guarantee. I think um the trusted item play a role in the objective function, but they didn't put um a much higher weight on it. Yeah. So say suppose they there's still a prob there's still a probability or there's still a possibility that um if you trust the items, the minimum effort to change the label is that it's going to change the oh sorry. The, so it is still possible that which the minimum effort to change the labels will have a sacrifice or will, will pay a price of making the trust items uh, with wrong prediction. Uh, let me say it again. So giving this method, their method will still cause a possibility where the trust, well, we do have a minimum on change on the label. We have a minimum change on the mm -hmm. However, it brings us the cost that the trust item has been misclassified by the model. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe, yes. I think, yeah. yeah I somehow didn't buy the approach. Um, keep, keep going on. But it's not about accuracy. It's all about finding bugs. Yeah, so that, um, finding bugs. But how, yeah, suppose I have changed a label and the model has been, been somehow been improved, but it's also introduced some, uh, it has still introduced some, some problem of that the model does not well predict the, 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 the trust item. So do you think it is still find a bug? Somehow uh, I didn't, I didn't follow the causality. I didn't follow the logic of how the- says when the, um, so here, if they have a change in the label, then the delta should be, or should not be zero. If, so that means if delta is zero, then there's no change. And if delta is not zero, then there's some change. So after they run their program and they propose um, there might some, be some bugs, that means um, the delta should not be zero, they would forward it to some domain expert and check whether um, those are truly bugs or not. Um, I, I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so actually the trusted, the trusted data are new data. Yeah. So the label of trusted data will not be changed, but only the original data label you change. I, I remember oh. that we have a, so Shani means that mm -hmm. data, they selected a few data, but selected two samples. So, uh, label them, label them whether these items can be trusted. So that means those labels will not be trusted. The, 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 the items um, are notated by the expert, their mm -hmm. label will not be changed. And that so, is X tilta, Y tilta. You can see this is the trusted item. Hmm. And so you don't you, you don't revise the Y um, tilde, but in the training data set, um, there might be some change. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And the optimization rationale is that after they hmm. on Y the loss function or the prediction is supposed to be correct. The model prediction is supposed to be correct. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The only role played by the trust data is that their label should not, should not be changed during the training. And that's all. Yes. Yes. <sighs> so they spent even, uh, nearly a page in their paper to um, in those mathematical formula to um, put the details, for example, the loss um, into their optimized uh, objective function and then they calculate all the gradient, the derivative, but the whole idea is quite simple. 
Mm. Do you think that makes sense? Or do you think it is a trusted approach to, for us to believe? Based on approach, if it's recorded, we need to change the images of one to two. Do you think this is a trustworthy approach? Um, actually, in their paper, they even, um, they even give some examples, some cases on, um, uh, some ex cases on um, how their how this duty um, doesn't work. <laughs> I think they also realize there's yeah, some, some cases. They're based on their approach. <clears throat> it is possible that it's, when they find they have some some mistakes, one model makes some mistakes, they just uh, change the labels according to the predictions. That is what the easy way. There is no way to prevent the mod prevent their, this approach to mutate the 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 misclass to mutate the misclassified item into the predictor label. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to prove that. And those items are only and those trusted items are only fixed. And there's also no there's no approach to compare or generalize the trusted items. For example, suppose I have labeled this one to be one, this picture to be one, and mm -hmm. somehow the similar or relevant pictures can still be propagated by such a labeling. But right, they have some, so suppose you have an idea like this. But for them, they still- Are, are you commenting on the screen? Okay, the- I can't, I can't see. Okay, the point is that suppose this label, right? Oh. So the picture looks like this, and the sun expert saying this is one, right? Oh. And so in this case, another picture will look like this, right? I was supposed to somehow their way to generalize this one to this one, and even if this if if this one has this has been mislabeled as as two, for example. So given the similarity, given the similarity, I can make such a generalization. But this approach, there's no such generalizations. Maybe. The generalization capability has been incorporated in the model. I don't know, but I still feel that I still feel a bit worried about the rationale of this approach. Mm. Mm. And also, giving, for example, someone has predicted this label. This is not a trusted label. Suppose uh, I'm saying that suppose this one is not a trusted label anymore, and it has been predicted as as nine, for example. And it make no, this approach makes no guarantee that this approach will actually change this, the label of this picture to not. Then the loss function will be minimized. Right, there's no guarantee for that. So you must have a trusted item that looks like um, these mislabeled items or near um, I think method? near it hmm. so that um, this um, th this method could work. Hmm. Hmm. So maybe we, we can. Okay, I think the trick here is not approach because approach is only model design loss function and then using a set of equations. I don't care about this equation. Maybe because they, they formalize this convex. Uh, landscape and they apply the, because the convex space has the problem that local optima will finally lead to the global optima. That is fine. That is fine. Even if it's not convex, that is also fine. But the problem, I think the challenge of this book lies in that how to find out the trusted item. That is the real challenge in thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And yes. also, this, this, this paper assumes that the number of bugs is none. That's almost ridiculous. So how getting the model is training, how do I know which the number of the number of the bugs, the number of the, the mis mislabeled item there? It is not possible. So I think this approach or this work circumvented or just ignored two fundamental problems in practice. For first is that how do we know these Samples can is represented enough to serve as the trust item. Second, how do we know there? How do we know there's a bug here? 
for the second problem is that whether there's whether there's a proof to warn us that there's a noise in the data, right? Automatically, of course, if we human going to check this and all that, how can Google find working on the Singtel project? We find there's some some data is it's 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 not well labeled, so Google find need to clean them manually. So whether there's a proof to give us the answer, given the phenomena, given the cases, and we have a very high probability that some some data has noise. So I think these two problems are the real problems, and all those mathematics we can in, we can we can invent our own. Those may not be the fundamental challenges in the practice. Um, that, that, that is my opinion. That is my opinion. Maybe you can provide your own. Mm, so, um, in your third question, I think, mm. uh, from my point of view, I think if we can make sure those trusted items is, um, suppose it can randomly, it has a distribution that um, is close to um, the training, the original training data set, then maybe um, we can find a visualization approach may provide some things. For example, giving the visualizations, and this is supposed to cousin some boundary. And a few days samples are here, but there's a sample are here. So in this case, we can based on the clustering algorithms to select the representative select the representative uh, items as a trust item. Right. And of course, then they do not have the hint for they just assume that experts have already found the representative item. And this Process actually the time consuming, time and effort consuming, mm. and the, the visualizations may also provide some outlier in the whole layout to showing that what is the suspicious, which one is suspicious uh, items with, or which is one is the item with suspicious label. Right, these visualizations may, I think, the visualizations might be a more, a more. Um, a more practical solution it may not be so sound, but it's more practical. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, let's keep going on. Um, so actually, if we can see the classification model, it looks um, the process is mostly um, equivalent to the regression model. So maybe we don't need to get into the yeah, deep. Let's keep those ones. But I think one of the comments I'm going to have, and after my comments, you can start. You can go with the experiment. My comment is that this approach is useful as long as the trust items and the number of bugs have already been fixed. Then we might use an automated, automated approach, maybe we integrate their approach to find which way, how do we to make the minimum perturbations to make the model correct. And then giving the visualizations and giving the outliers from the visualized layout Maybe we do not need to retrain the model. We can just use the exist model to see. Maybe we can just use the matrix of the loss function to evaluate if we mutate some of the labels, whether the measurement will be improved so that we know that this label is a little suspicious. Mm. Mm, OK. Um, so this algorithm basically, it, it, it tells you um, that it initialized the gamma, um, the weight, the, this gamma, the weight of, um, the weight of distance. Um, that initialized it with some value, and uh, um, they just keep find they they keep find the uh, delta that can minimize the objective function, and uh, they calculate uh, how much delta would not be zero in a regression model or um, delta ij will not be the same with yi. So those are um, the change label and they keep it, those in re record. And after um, this um, bug set, the number of these bug set is equals to the budget. Mm -hmm. um, from the input, they stop this program and output um, uh, the gamma and delta set. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So from the experiment part, they have three baselines. So the first is 
called influence function. So the influence function um, is just the first term of our objective gradient. So they can view this influence function as a approximate of um, this duty method, a simplified version of duty. Um, and the second baseline is called nearest neighbor. So it's quite clear. They just um, use the um, nearest neighbor algorithm. So they use the nearest neighbor based on the input or the nearest uh, neighbor based on the embedding distance. Embed, huh? Embedding? Embedding distance is that given the images. They're using the nearest, the nearest the neighbor based on. Oh, I, I mean, mm. they just find, for example, they find um, can you replace um, Yeah, I understand the neighbor. I'm asking the neighbor distance. How do you, I, how do they give, define neighbor? And how do they measure, how do they measure, measure the, the distance between two inputs? Uh, it, it, I'm going to say, what I, my point is that it makes no sense if they mm. are using the mm. L2 distance or equal distance between two images, mm. right? Pixel mm. wise difference makes no difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. If they, they will, if they claim the output these, these versions, then it actually makes no sense. Um, I, I didn't pay attention to okay. this, yeah, when I'm reading a paper. Um, so the last one is called label noise detection. Um, I, I don't know the detail about this method, but um, there's two properties that um, this L and D can only work on um, binary, binary label and also um, it also needs to specify how many uh, cont contaminated items in advance. So um, let's first look at the toy data from um, the previous previous slide. So the ground uh, ground the true decision boundary is the red straight line, and uh, they run uh, influence and nearest neighbor and duty on um, this data set. And uh, the let me comment. The um, influence uh, influence function do not perform well because it suggests um, some uh, wrong data and uh, nearest neighbor. Uh, it also has some uh, wrong bugs. And however, for but it looks much better. Oh uh, yeah yeah yeah. And they also use a PR curves to uh, evaluate their methods. So uh, PR curve precision is the true positive over true positive plus um, false positive and recall is uh, equals to true positive over true positive plus false negative. So um, the line should be close to uh, one. If we are close to one, then um, it's better. So from this, uh, from C, we can see that the duty performs the best. And given this experiment, what does the number of budget is defined for duty? Budget. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, I've got. Maybe yeah. let's keep going on. Let's mm, keep... Okay. So, mm. and then the second. Um, experiment is um, do on real data. Yeah, so this, working on the, it seems that they are not working on the deep learning model, right? No, no, no. Uh, they are all um, simple, uh, like regression model. Mm -hmm. And so this one is binary. Uh, let me see. This is binary classification. Um, and this one should be uh, also, it's more like a, yes, more like a binary. Whether we need to learn. Yeah. So, uh, how they um 
collect their data set is um, the prior work suggests there might be a systematic bias of um, decline applicant younger than 0 0.5 in German known application. Um, so the first, the step one is to, um, the original data set con uh, consists of 1,000 applicants um, with only uh, 119 young and 810 old. So they partition the data set into three subsets A, B, C. So um, subset set A contains um, 20 young and 20 old. B contains 170 uh, young and 170 old. And uh, C contains 610 old. So they use group C to train a, a, a classifier F. So they view this F as a um, ground truth concept. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, run group A using F and uh, uh, relabel the group A um, as the trusted items. And then group B with the original, um, then group B should be the buggy training set. And uh, um, so that's how they collect this um, buggy data set. And then they run their, um, uh, they run their experiments on it. And we can first then look at the adult income data set and compare them together because um, how they collect this adult income data set um, is quite similar to the previous one. So they also found out in this data set, there might be a systematic bias against female. And then they do the same um, partition to the data set. And yeah, it's quite similar to the um, previous one. And then we can look at the results. A is the uh, result from German known, known PR curves. And the second one is adult income. Um, yeah, so from these results, they said um, the duty performs the best again um, among the uh, four different. Okay, I think we can quickly uh, for the end to this talk. Uh, mm -hmm. comment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So let me look at uh, this main data, the main data. Yeah, so um, first they train um, five. First, <clears throat> they collect a data set. Um, each digit has 500 um, images and they train a clean neural net F. And then they randomly choose um, 40 per digit data um, to be a training data set and then blur them again and get a budget, budget labels. <clears throat> and then they replace the um, labels uh, this process tries to simulate um, the mislabeling um, by human. And the three, step three is to randomly choose um, 16 uh, per digit to be trusted <coughs> items. So the result also shows the duty is the best. And uh, uh, from D, uh, <coughs> chart D, so actually they set the uh, box, the budget box to be different number and uh, calculate number of correct places. So there are 133 bug in their training data set. And uh, in the end, they, the uh, duty methods found nearly um, half of them. I think so that's their claim from the I think there's a point they need to take care is that the number of the buggy, the number of the buggy items or the number of the buggy training set. Suppose the portion, suppose there's only a, a small portion of the buggy uh, item, the approach can be fixed. Suppose there's a very large number of the noise data and the model cannot work anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So because if they even using the maximum likelihood estimation, uh, given there's a lot of run there, 
the whole model will be actually to mutate or change the label of those those corrected label. Apart to propose the number the number of the noise is too large for that. Um, mm. Here, I think for well, now, let's let's uh, Chen have a put a quick end of what we talk. Yeah. Okay, and uh, and there's a example on regression models because they they have regression models and classifications in the um in their method. So um, anyway, from the average PR curves, the duty performs the best. But they said there are a lot of limitations in this work. So the first one is um applic applic ability. So they actually proposed three uh, cases when um, when their uh, method won't work. So the first one is um, they use a um, sorry um, so in all ca cases the dashed line is the true decision boundary and uh, from chart A, they use a a straight line to uh, to separate to be um to be their model. So that actually there's no bug in the training set, but they use a um um bad model to um. I'm sorry. So, so let me. Yeah, so, so let me put a quick end for this. Mm -hmm. So here for this problem, it will, be, it will become extremely hard for runs. Suppose the model has a missed predictions. It's very hard to say uh, whether the input has a problem or whether the model has a problem. So yeah. I think here, I think given their approach, they're going to find the track items or whether to find whether you're going to, going to mutate the labels. I think this is very. Uh, rough work. It's very rough work. The first step is going to see on uh, how to blend the fault on model, mm -hmm. blend the fault on input. So generally, they were using some some game based approach to learning diffusions. Can you see where this um, input or where this model or where the input is an outlier, or whether the label of the input is an outlier? So usually, this anomaly detection based approach seems to more uh, make more sense. Uh, possibly more plausible. And for this approach, the rationale is that they would just like to have the minimum mutation perturbation so that the model have a better accuracy. And without regarding the original model fault, I think this approach is very, somehow it's quite limited. It can hardly be adopted. Yeah, and the second point, we already talked about it before. The trust they said the trusted items need to be informative, but in um yeah reality so, it's very hard so, to say. Here, so overall here is a very interesting problem. So this a it's a round time problem. So given the model, I think the visualization can play a good role here. So suppose the model is a round time and the giving there's a new for example when the model has been deployed in the round time and when the new data samples is coming. And how do we know that these samples is, is an outlier sample or whether whether these samples should be, whether the sample is adversary samples. But I have to have a concrete idea to using visualizations to render the adversary samples on the on the, on, the, on the graph or on the campus, a canvas. But anyway, we should have if we would like to tackle this problem, we will have a more sophisticated approach than this one. For this one, it has a too strong an exception for us to, for us to adopt. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so and then the last point is they only support training data set in mm. the thousands. So I think, I think can... the, scalability problem, the scalability problem hasn't been a problem here. It's <laughs> a very large. Yeah, okay. yeah, but anyway, you can see even so, you should again, we should gain confidence from these triple AI. Uh, mm. it's, not, it's not so scary. And sometimes it has more challenge and the problems should not be so significant. And the solution, once we can have some, once something can be done, it have a chance to be get accepted. But of course, the EJKI and the AAAI are doing something 
to further minimize the acceptance rate. Okay, keep going on. Yeah, yeah. So basically, that's all. They they um introduce the duty and efficient. I guess not so efficient. Um, that can help the user to um identify training set box um with trusted items, and they also do some empirical experiments um to demonstrate their um duty is able to find those bugs. Yeah. So that's my presentation today. Okay. Thanks, mm -hmm. And um, is there anyone have the problem on this work? Okay, if not, let's call it a day. Uh, thanks, or thanks, Xiangling, Rofan, and one one have fun uh, for giving these presentations. Uh, let's meet next week. Okay, bye. Bye.